when you turn the page to chapter 19, we're going to have the story of a rich man coming to Jesus. Okay, so with the parable, that, or the story of the, it's not a parable, this actually is a historical story, with the rich young ruler, I'm going to call him the RYR, the rich young ruler, um, is in contrast then, the rich young ruler is wealthy but doesn't make it, but then we have another rich person who actually does make it, and this is Zacchaeus. Now, it's very interesting, too, in this narrative, how it sets up the story. In other words, in each case, Luke introduces a character who faces Jesus with an opposition. There's an obstacle. There's an obstacle. The person comes to Jesus, is seeking to come to Jesus, but there's an obstacle in the way. So the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he asks him how he can you know, get into the kingdom and things, and, and, and he has an obstacle. The obstacle is his wealth. He can't overcome that obstacle, so he turns away. And so there's a blind man, like similarly. There's a blind beggar. And he's, now this is taking place in Jericho, okay? So Jesus is down in Jericho, down in the valley, just north of the Dead Sea there, we saw earlier, okay? And the blind man, what's the, what's the obstacle that the blind man's trying to get to Jesus, but he can't get to Jesus because the crowd's there? So the blind man cries out, you know, Jesus, have mercy on me and stuff as Jesus is passing by. And the crowd tells, the crowd tells the beggar, the blind beggar, be quiet, be quiet, don't say it. You know, Jesus is coming by here, don't be yelling like that. And the more they tell him to quiet down, the more he jacks it up, and he yells more and more. And uh, so the blind beggar, what happens? He's got an obstacle. The crowd is his obstacle. He's blind. He can't get to Jesus. What does he do? He screams out more, and Jesus then heals the blind beggar. So there's an obstacle. Now what you've got is the story of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, he also has an obstacle. And what is the obstacle for Zacchaeus? Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man there was by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He was a tax collector and was wealthy. Now remember the rich young ruler. It's hard, the conclusion of the story of the rich young ruler, it's hard, harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom than the camel to go through an eye of a needle. But here we have a wealthy man. He wanted to see Jesus, to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So again, you've got the crowd being an obstacle. He can't get to Jesus because he's a small, short guy and can't get through there. So his height is a problem. By the way, do you see why the story of Zacchaeus is a wonderful one to tell the kids? Kids live in a world of what? Big people. And kids are small. Zacchaeus was small. Kids can relate to that. They can't get to see Jesus because of the crowd because they're just little. And so there was, if you remember, there was a movie years ago called Big, in which you know a kid basically is putting a big body and stuff. And anyway, so so he ran ahead and climbed in a sycamore tree. So what does he do? Like a kid would do, he climbs up in the sycamore tree. And if you go to Jericho, they have a sycamore tree there till this day. Obviously not the same sycamore tree, but uh, he goes to the sycamore fig tree. And he, to, to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm staying at your house today, today. So he came down and at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter. Notice the crowd's response. They mutter, he has gone to be a guest of a sinner? But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation what is the point? Luke is emphasizing salvation. Jesus is the Savior of all. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Remember the prodigal son, the lost son? We also talk about the lost coin, the woman searching a house for the lost coin. Here you have... Jesus come seeking and saving that which is lost. So, there's an obstacle for Zacchaeus, his short height and the crowd. There's an obstacle for the rich young ruler, his wealth and things. Now, 
both Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler, both of them are wealthy. The conclusion, actually, the story of the, of the rich young ruler was that it's hard for a wealthy person to uh, enter into the kingdom of heaven, harder than to go through an eye of a needle for a camel. The rich young ruler keeps the commandments. And so, you know, Jesus said, have you kept the commandments? And the guy says, I've kept the commandments since my youth. And so this guy is actually a morally upright person. He's kept the commandments and things. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, Zacchaeus is a contrast to that. Zacchaeus is a wealthy tax collector. How does Zacchaeus get his money? He is wealthy, he's a tax collector. They're both wealthy, but Zacchaeus gets it by violating. Um, why were tax collectors looked on so poorly in that culture? Largely, tax collectors, kind of like the IRS is today, um, the, the Romans came in and basically were sucking taxes out of Palestine, and so basically they would have these tax collector guys, and basically they would, uh, they would collect taxes for the Romans. And not only would they collect the taxes that was owed to the Romans, but they would also then cushion things and take some money for themselves. In other words, if they're collecting taxes, they'd collect, you know, add 10%, 20% onto that. And that's what you pay me for collecting the taxes. So they got wealthy off the backs of their own people. They got wealthy off the backs of their own people. So these guys would be viewed as traitors. They were supporting Rome. They were the, they were the gophers for Rome. And so they were basically traitors. They were looked on as sellouts, might be another way. They were looked as, on, on as sellouts. They had sold out to Rome, and they're selling their own people. They're selling their own people in favor of Rome so that they can personally profit on the backs of their own people. So tax collectors were just absolutely despicable people and would have been despised by the Jewish people who were wanting to throw off the Roman yoke. Do you remember that Matthew also, Matthew, our Matthew, Levi, uh, was also a tax collector. And they came to Matthew's house, and the people, same reaction there. How can Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? And yet Jesus seems to, the tax, and so what happens? Okay, so Zac, Zacchaeus basically violates the commands and things like that. Now, the rich young ruler is counseled to sell all he has and give to the poor. Jesus tells him, you've got to sell all you have and give to the poor. What's very interesting here is there's a big change that happens. Does Jesus ever say to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, you're a wealthy man. You need to give that wealth away and give it to the poor. Jesus never says anything to Zacchaeus. He never says anything to Zacchaeus. When you read the story here, it says, and let me just show you the transition here. Jesus says, come down from the tree. I'm going to your house today. And all the people then mutter, and then what's Zacchaeus' response? Jesus says nothing in the narrative. Jesus says nothing. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Zacchaeus voluntarily, this is what he does voluntarily. Jesus recognizes him, that's all. He's going to his house. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Zacchaeus volunteers. Jesus commands and, and tells this guy he's got to give his, the rich young ruler to give his, to give his money to the poor. He cannot do it, okay, because he's so attached to it. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, he voluntarily, voluntarily, and so what you see is God's work in Zacchaeus's life. Jesus does not have to tell him. Zacchaeus just does it automatically. He knows what's right to do. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Beautiful statement. Today salvation has come. How has salvation come? Zacchaeus gives half of his stuff to the poor. Again, very interesting way of how was Zacchaeus uh, in his salvation. The conclusion, uh, the story here, the rich young ruler, can the wealthy be saved? That was the question. Can the wealthy be saved? And Jesus says, it's really hard, man. It's like a camel going through an eye of a needle. It's almost impossible. And yet Zacchaeus, Jesus, the rich young ruler, this thing is, how can the wealthy be saved? With Zacchaeus, the answer is, Today, salvation has come to your house, Zacchaeus. And you, and you are a, a child of Abraham. And you are a child of Abraham. Now, what's interesting in the story, remember how we're telling how you write a story? And the beginning and the end are very similar. It's very interesting. Jesus reached the spot. He looked up. Zacchaeus is up in the tree. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Jesus says, I must stay at your house today. That's how the story begins. 
I'm going to come to your house, Zacchaeus. I'm going to stay at your house. How does the story end? Today, salvation has come to this house. Do you get the association? The story opens with Jesus coming to his house, and then Jesus pronounces, today salvation has come to this house. Who, what is Luke doing in writing this story? I think he's associating Jesus with salvation. I'm coming to your house, salvation is coming to your house. It's a beautiful way, and actually they, they have a, a, a literary thing. They call this an inclusio. An inclusio, it begins the same way it ends. Jesus comes to his house, salvation comes to his house. And so the, the story is bounded, kind of like bookends. It's bounded by this coming to Zacchaeus' house. Jesus comes, salvation comes to this man's house. And so it's associating Jesus with Savior, and Jesus is the Savior of all men, including Zacchaeus. And you see this happen. This raises an interesting story for me from uh, my past in terms of this thing that Zacchaeus, does Zacchaeus say, oh, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved? Does Zacchaeus, does it say anywhere that Zacchaeus believed in Jesus? No. What you see is Zacchaeus' actions. He gives half of his wealth to the poor. He repays anybody he's ripped off four times what he stole. Once upon a time, I, um, I taught in a maximum security prison in Indiana for about a decade, about 10 years. I would teach in a college during the day, and then the evenings we'd ride up to, it was about an hour and a half ride up to Michigan City, to a maximum security prison up there. In that class, I had a, a man we used to call Provo. Uh, his name was John Schultz, and uh, but Provo. And Provo was one of the smartest guys I've ever taught, actually. But he was an older guy. He was probably he was, came out of Vietnam. He was a Vietnam vet, and he was in prison. He had um, killed a couple guys and things, and it was bad. But uh, Provo sat in class, and he would never take a note. And uh, when he would take my tests, he would basically get hundreds of my tests. He had like a photographic ear, man. He could remember anything you said he could remember. And he got that, I think, in the military, where they would offer commands. He was in an, uh, special services uh, in the military, and he could just, he just re remember what you said. And uh, really, really bright guy. Well, what happened was I came, uh, I, I taught at Grace College for about 20 years, and then I came out to Gordon College here in Boston area, and uh, Provo was getting out of prison. He was about 55 at the time, and he was getting out of prison, and uh, he actually got out of prison, and he had always told me, Ted, when I get out of prison, I'm gonna, he's a big Harley guy and stuff. Nobody messed with this guy in prison. He was, he was a tough guy. And um, he's gonna get a Harley, and he was gonna come, and he said, I'm gonna come to a college campus and buzz me. Uh, in Indiana, they, they kind of take off some of the the mufflers on these um, Harleys and stuff, and they make huge noise. You can hear the Harley a mile away. You can hear this thing. And so I'm always up in my office at Gordon College saying, one of these days, and I, I prayed for uh, Provo. For, he was out of prison for a couple of years. He married a Christian girl, and I always thought that was so weird because Provo was not really Christian. As a matter of fact, he would challenge me in class. Uh, he was a very bright guy, and any time he could find an error in the Bible, he would be all over me, and, you know, I disproved the Bible. This stuff is a bunch of baloney, and... And, and he would call it other things and things, but we would go back and forth and we would have kind of an argument. I really enjoyed the guy. The guy was uh, just a really, really bright guy. He was, uh, but he would always probe, always, always probing something and coming at me uh, with this stuff. Well, he got out of prison. I was praying for him. And uh, I was away here at Boston. This was back in Indiana. And it uh, turns out that um, about a year after he died, I found out that he had been dead for like a year, a year and a half, that he was riding his motorcycle and his coat had got caught in the back tire and he had gone straight in, uh, threw him off, the, the bike stopped instantly when the tire got, and he going, projected off of his motorcycle head first into a guardrail and was killed instantly. And um, I was at a conference, this is back in November, I was at a conference and I had to write a, read a paper down in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was down there with this guy named Ron Clutter. And Ron and I went to lunch and he was from Indiana. And as we were leaving, we talked and talked and talked, old memories kind of thing, two old men talking. And, and as I got up to leave, he said, do you remember John Schultz? Do you remember old Provo? And I said, yeah, do I remember Provo? I was so angry. You, nobody, over, here, I'm out in Boston and nobody told me he was dead. I was praying for that dude for a year, over a year, and he was dead already and nobody told me that he was dead. And so I felt kind of betrayed that, you know, nobody told me and stuff. So I told it to Ron and Ron said, well, let me tell you the rest of what happened with Provo. He got out of prison and he married a Christian woman. Remember I told you it didn't make sense because he wasn't a Christian. He was really anti-Christian in a lot of ways. Probo never told anyone 
that he became a Christian. But as a matter of fact, he accepted the Lord. But he said, Provo said, I don't want to have to say it to people. I want people to see that my life, God has changed my life. And so basically, Provo wasn't one of these guys that was always Jesus every other word kind of person, where he's going to, you know, I'm a religious person now. He didn't, his voice didn't come out religious and stuff. What Provo's, it changed his life. And he says, if it changes my life, my life will speak louder than my words. And so I am a Christian and my life has changed. And they will be able to see that. And I really respect that. That's what you get with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, his life's changed. He doesn't have to go around saying, Jesus this and Jesus that, no Christian. No, no, his life changed. How did the people know his life changed? The people knew his life changed because the guy gives half of what he has to the poor. He's a wealthy person. He, he pays back anybody he ripped off four times. And when they get that money back, they say, whoa, what's happened to old Zacchaeus? God, Jesus, salvation has come to your house today. And um, anyway... So that's, uh, that's the story of Zacchaeus, and I think what Luke is doing is he's playing off these two stories, the rich young ruler and the story of Zacchaeus, and they play off each other. They're both wealthy. One, salvation comes to his house, Zacchaeus. The other one is attached to his wealth, and he turns away. And so these two stories. So that's kind of an intertextual reading. And What I'm, I'm working on here is just trying to get you to to think about how do you interpret the Bible? How do you interpret the Bible? What is your hermeneutic? Hermeneutics is a study of how you interpret the Bible. And what I'm saying is that you can read these stories intertextually, like you read the story of the rich young ruler, and you say, wow, there's a lot of things that compare with the story of, of, of Zacchaeus, and the stories play off one another. And so in order to understand the story of Zacchaeus properly, I think you need to understand the story of the rich young ruler. And the story of the rich young ruler ends up with the conclusion, how can the wealthy be saved? And the solution to that is Zacchaeus, where he is a wealthy person, but he does what, what the rich young ruler was not able to do, even though the rich young ruler was more moral in many senses than Zacchaeus was. Okay, So just those kind of uh, stories and plays with Zacchaeus. Okay, This inclusio, this is that word that I told you before, the inclusio, beginning and ending. I'm coming to your house, salvation is coming to your house, associating whom's, who is seeking whom. Is Zacchaeus seeking Jesus, or is Zac Jesus seeking Zacchaeus? And so you get this kind of like reversal that takes place there. So Zacchaeus seeking salvation. This is just a kind of a diagram, how to diagram this out. Here's Zacchaeus, here's Jesus, here's the crowds. The crowds then are going to form an obstacle, and so what you get is something like this. Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus. But the crowd's in his way, and so basically he's got to overcome this, this obstacle of the crowd. And so Zacchaeus has got to overcome the crowds. The crowd murmurs and rejects Zacchaeus. So he's got to overcome the obstacle of the crowd's in his way. He's a small guy. They reject and murmur against Zacchaeus. So he's got not just the size thing, but also the rejection of the people in the crowd and feeling that rejection. The crowd, by the way, does not seem to be associated with Jesus. It's Zacchaeus that connects with Jesus, not the crowd. And so the crowd's cut off from Jesus, and then what you get is, basically, uh, these Zacchaeus repents and repays and gives to the crowds, okay, the poor people and things like that. Crowds. He pays back the people of what he'd done, so Zacchaeus repents and things, and then what you get is Jesus in other words, Zacchaeus seeking Jesus, and now you've got salvation and Jesus seeking Zacchaeus. And so I think this is just kind of a graphic way of, of, of a lot of these stories with Jesus. You have the person, you have a crowd, usually the Pharisees, Sadducees, or some obstacle, and you've got Jesus. And then you've got this basically this triangulation thing going on with a lot of these stories. Okay, And so I think this just puts it graphically.